then first, good morning and welcome to the academic training lectures in IT. Uh, before I start the usual introduction, I would like to remind you of how the lectures will work. Uh, first, the speaker will deliver the usual lecture, followed by a question and answer slot at the end. And you can ask questions via chat that I will read them uh, or raise your hand via Zoom and I will give you your turn. Okay, so as you know, here at CERN, we have a dedicated framework for the processing of personal data called OC11, and this was born uh, in 2019, so quite recently. And the purpose of this new circular is to set out the organization approach to data privacy. It brings together the privacy principles, as well as the rights and obligation of the organization with regard to this processing of data that you know that here at CERN we have a huge amount of data. So then since um, this data privacy is so important for us here at CERN, I'm really delayed to introduce you our uh, uh, old colleague, let's say, you no, know, our current colleague, because he's all the time collaborating with us here at CERN, which is Anja Novak, uh, who is going to excite, uh, to, uh, to um, to guide us no, in a journey uh, with, uh, in privacy with a dose of systematization in three parts. That is why we have these three lectures. Uh, just let me give uh, some words about Anjek, who was spending the last 15 years uh, in the juncture of the technology, business, and innovation. His experience comes from the computer security. In fact, he was uh, working, as I was saying, here at CERN, in the CERN Open Lab, collaboration with CERN and industry partnerships of Google, HP, Huawei, Intel, Oracle, and Siemens. Also, uh, he was uh, part of the CTO office where he helped set up uh, the next generation technology projects for CERN. So, and more recently, and found, uh, founded a small technology and innovation consultancy as well as a fintech, fintech startup. And in the last few years, he worked in management consulting, in finance and innovation management. So as you can see, he's a very busy guy and also collaborating in our school of computing here at CERN. And also, yeah, he was mentioning that his current topics of interest include the future of identity, privacy, and money. So I'm sure that we are going to enjoy and learn a lot uh, with him in this lecture today. So please join me to welcome Anjek Novak. I know that we cannot clap, but I will do for all of you. So please, Anjek, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Maria. Thank you for this kind introduction. And um, thank you to all of you who have decided to join this series on a very interesting topic, which obviously is privacy. Um, I hope I'm coming through OK. So in case I'm speaking and you can hear me, just let me know. But I think it should be fine. Um, so well, where should we start? Um, as, as Maria said, my name is uh, Andrzej Novak. The question is who I am or what is my legitimacy to speak about the subject where, you know, I've, I've worked in big tech, I've worked at CERN uh, in management consulting. Um, you know, now I work in innovation management, but most importantly, I'm a person who is interested in privacy. So like many of you, I'm a privacy enthusiast and I came here to share some thoughts with you. And I think we should take it from that perspective. So it's very difficult to make a, an exhaustive lecture about privacy and especially in just a few hours when there are full university curricula that basically relate to the subject. Nevertheless, I think it's really valid to have this discussion and to start it and also to put some thoughts on the table for all of us to consider and to think about um, what that means for us, what are the implications of the various things that are happening today and where are things going in the future. Um, so I will share some slides with you now. Um, let's just try to dump this screen um, right there. I hope you're able to see it fine. Maybe someone can just type in the chat whether you can see it okay. It's, it's working. Um, Perfect. All right, excellent. Great to hear that. So 
this lecture is really split uh, into um, into three parts that are not really official. This is a conversation. Uh, there's there's a lot of personal research that went into this uh, into this topic, so it's personal interest, obviously, that's powering it. Um, and this research does not represent in any view in any way the views of my um, employer. First, start with an introduction. Then we'll talk more about the past. So this will be a kind of more uh, history-oriented and philosophy philosophy-oriented uh, from. Um, Tomorrow, we will look more at current events, so maybe the things that have unfolded in the last few years uh, will basically try to determine where we are right now, uh, what are the threats that are, that are coming in, and possibly how we should defend ourselves. So today will not be very technical. Tomorrow, tomorrow I think, will be a little bit more te technical. And then on the third day, so Thursday, we will look more at the future. So what kind of scenarios could we foresee or forecast um, for privacy? And what is the direction that things are taking today? And then, of course, we'll have some final thoughts. And I hope that you know we can have this conversation with you as well, built on the questions that you might be asking about this. Um, so just to illustrate the level of the discussion that we're having today, um, I'd like to show you a little icebreaker. So um, this is a real screenshot from a real website that appeared at the beginning of the uh, COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, the Australian government posted a frequently asked question on their website, and the question was, is it true? Can COVID-19 vaccines connect me to the internet? And the answer is, well, surprise, no, they cannot. They, they cannot connect you to the internet, and they do not connect you to the internet. So this is what we typically, um, this, is, this is, let's say, the the level of public discourse right i think for everybody in science and technology who have been following these events uh, it becomes clear that communicating uh, certain scientific and technological advances um, to the general population has to be done with a lot of care and attention right and and this is where these questions are stemming from and i think that we can uh, definitely also transpose some of that uh, uncertainty onto questions that surround privacy. So what is privacy itself? I think we'll be coming back to that term a little bit uh, throughout the talk, and we'll be refining our understanding as we go along. Um, but we should probably start with a definition from the Enc Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy, which basically says that there is no single definition or analysis or meaning of the term. And they say that basically almost immediately at the beginning of the article on privacy. So you know, privacy is something that we have in ordinary language that appears in political discussions, in legal test, texts, in philosophical texts, but there's not a clear uh, definition. So if we wanted to, you know, regardless of that, you know, the best scholars are not offering something that is, you know, really uh, crisp. And then if you look into the dictionaries, you will see very different definitions everywhere you look. Um, let's try to maybe define it in maybe human terms. Um, and I would say that Privacy is the ability to keep stuff to oneself. So this basically includes the right to be alone or some kind of autonomy. Uh, this includes control. And this also includes selective disclosure. So you are able to say what you would possibly want to disclose to the party you're conversing with or not. And so there are many implications of, of uh, these elements of privacy. So the questions would be, are we using encryption? Are we using passwords? Are we using curtains in our house? You're muted. Andrew, you're muted. Um, someone muted me by accident, I think. Apologies again. Um, so again, we're coming back to the implications of this, right? Um, whether we use encryption, whether we use passwords, whether we use uh, curtains in our home or blinds or fences of door locks, all of these mechanisms are designed to, um, to protect our privacy, right? We wouldn't show necessarily to others our financial statements, our medical records. And in fact, privacy, and that's a topic, you know, theme we're going to come back to many times, is not so much about secrecy as it is about control. So in the digital age, especially once something is out, it's really out, right? It's out there and you are kind of losing control over the digital copy of whatever was out there. So a lack of privacy results in a transfer of control or a 
transfer of power. And I think we're going to be looking into that uh, also in time. So privacy and secrecy are a very big topic. So for example, um, if you tell your doctor how you feel, that's not a secret, but it is something that's private. Uh, and the same goes for, for instance, for the conversation is that you have a dinner with your family. That's something that you would tell your family, but it's not something that you would want to uh, put in public. So privacy and secrecy are not exactly the same thing, even though they kind of go hand in hand. So in these cases, you basically you want to ensure that you remain in control and that you trust the counterparty to respect whatever you have um, uh, whatever you have decided for that information, right? So I would like to distinguish those two terms, privacy and secrecy. And then even though there also is sometimes conflation between those two terms, uh, uh, privacy and anonymity are not quite the same things. So um, if we take, you know, the classical um, classification of the four experiences of privacy from Alan Weston, we see that there's an enumeration of solitude, intimacy, anonymity, and reserve. Um, and these are, you know, progressing, de decreasing in terms of the, let's say, strength of privacy that you would have. And solitude would then lead to a physical separation from others. So you are really away from everybody and you are not going to be, uh, you're not going to be bothered. Therefore, there is no communication. You can be sure that you are uh, separated. Um, in terms of intimacy, you could have close, relaxed, frank relationships of two or more people. So, for example, you can be intimate with your family, tell them your deepest secrets, or perhaps with your friends, but it's not something that would typically go out in the public. Um, and then in terms of anonymity itself, it's something we could call public privacy. So it's um, a way to exist in public but still retain your privacy or keep your identity private to some extent. And then finally, we have reserve. So this is a type of barrier uh, which is built up against unwanted intrusion. So you see that already we're talking of very violent actions, which are, for instance, intrusion. So what is it that will drive those actions? And in order to understand that, we have to think about two things. Um, the first one is related to incentives. Um, and the second one is related to who your adversary really is. So I think, you know, it's important to pay attention to these two topics um, throughout the talk because um, incentives will have to do with why people are after the information that you have, who wants to do what, why. Uh, and you will notice that our relationships with third parties that are encroaching on our privacy is usually adversarial. So we are not necessarily working in tandem with those who want to um, obtain our data or information about us. Um, so one example could, for instance, be um, the design of digital services for maximum engagement. So the incentive of the digital service is to retain you and to keep you engaged, to keep you clicking, scrolling, because that changes the things you see on the screen. And that then gives control over your attention to the other party. Um, the second very key thing that I think is really important here is who your adversary is. Uh, so it could be a government, a corporation, a hacker, a stalker, it could be a friend. Uh, so this has a lot to do with the classical field, uh, you know, in, in any kind of security, but also in computer security, which is threat modeling. So, so this is something that, uh, that even on a rudimentary scale, I think is important to do uh, in certain cases. So, um, you know, you could see this kind of adversarial relationship even with uh, with your friends. You can ask yourself how many of us have played with these statuses that you have in Internet communicators or, or phone messengers where it shows whether the message was received or there is a last seen status and maybe you don't want to reveal that and not every platform allows you to do that, right? So it's a very basic consideration and the adversary could be very close, right? Even when you don't want someone to see whether you've seen a message, uh, that's already a question of privacy and it could be a sort of adversarial relationship. Um, and then there's also the question of what you means, who you are. Are you a person? Are you a group? Are you a corporation? And that's also a topic that we'll come back to. So basically, this is um, the question of identity. So, you know, um, coming back to threat modeling and um, activities of this kind, which experts generally would recommend to some degree, 
um, it's something important to think about because it doesn't cost us that much to consider who is uh, chasing us and for which purpose. And, you know, they used to say the data is the new oil. I would almost say the data is uh, the new electricity. We're really past the oil stage. Uh, you know, it's, it's alike because when you remove it, things stop working. When you remove the data, suddenly digital platforms don't work anymore. Uh, if you make a bad judgment, uh, that data could zap you and it could happen suddenly that um, a company holding data is going to be fined and data becomes a liability. Some companies are smart. They realize that having private data is an issue and they just don't want to hold it. If you use the data, it will take you very far. If you leak the data, others are going to grow in power through that leak, right? And you can see, for example, what's been happening with recent events. There are many data leaks that really shine a lot of information at what's happening. So all of that really relates to a key position of data and that relates to your data and that data very often should be private, but is not. So the question is, how did we get here? How did we get to that point? And uh, what could we possibly do to better understand the motivations that we have, but also the motivations of others to, uh, to kind of chase us? And what were the factors that enabled this kind of development? So in a way, we will be talking about why privacy is important, much more from a historical perspective than any other. And we will try to understand how has the need for privacy evolved and which factors were important, which factors were not important. So let's start by talking about identity. It's not really a topic of uh, a subject in this talk in itself, but identity is very interesting because it can be considered in some senses opposite to anonymity. So if we wanted to define identity, we'd say that it's probably the distinguishing character of personality or of an individual, so that's linked to individuality, um, or you could say it's a relation that's established by psychological identification. So this means that we have um, some link built up that is psychological to something else that exists elsewhere, and we construct our identity from factors that are around us. So we'll get back to that classification uh, in a moment. But the reason why I say that to some extent, uh, or let's say coarsely, identity is opposed to anonymity is because it's difficult to prove your identity and remain anonymous. Um, an invasion of your privacy is also an invasion of your identity. And the identity that you have is going to encompass the memories, the experiences, the relationships and values uh, that create uh, your value of yourself. So basically you create that picture in your mind and then you project it, others can see it um, and so on. Um, and then, you know, many of the relationships that you have and cultivate, such as, for example, uh, you know, your identity as a child, as a friend, as a partner, parent, and so on, uh, forms an important piece of that and is really um, involving a lot of the external characteristics over which you don't really have control, right? So you kind of accept thing what comes from the outside and you um, internalize this. Your identity is also the way you look. So, for example, your height your race, your uh, socioeconomic class, and so on. And then even further things such as religious beliefs or political opinions, all of that relates to choices that you make on a daily basis. And all of that relates to information that you probably reveal on a daily basis to parties um, that you select. So it's not just personal identity that can exist. It's also uh, an identity of groups that we could talk about. And even things can have an identity. And we see our own identity, but it can be bestowed upon us by um, others too. So we don't speak that much about it because it's a concept we typically think of, you know, in a very streamlined way. It's a kind of implicit part of many things we're discussing. But, you know, even the emergence of personal identity, I think, is an interesting thing to look into. So, for instance, if we look back into history, jewelry was a very um prominent way of displaying identity and identity used to be understood as belonging to a group or being a part of a group it was less individualistic so on the picture here you can see a um uh, a shot of um, of a ring that would basically denote that you are part of the teutonic knights order so you would flash your identity as belonging to a certain group, right? You would communicate to others first what group you are part of rather than who you are or what kind of person you are, right? And then the strength would be um, 
in numbers, so to speak. So communicating, communicating identity as part of a group was really not something very individualistic. And uh, you know, modern jewelry also communicates the wealth or gender or you know even marital status or religious beliefs of the persons who are uh, who are wearing those. And just in the same way, ancient jewelry used to transmit that um, quite a bit as well. Um, then another good example, I think, is that of uh, Maori tattoos from New Zealand. So basically, the head was considered to be the most important part of the body, um, and it would it would carry elaborate tattoos uh, or mocha, which were regarded as marks uh, of high status. And basically, every um, tattoo would have a meaning, would have a specific shape. The placement of that tattoo would uh, matter a lot. So, for example, if it was uh, positioned around the brows, it would symbolize the a position in the tribe, then it would, if it would be placed around the nose, uh, it would symbolize the rank. So, for example, you could be a chief of the tribe that, that would wear a tattoo like that. Um, if it's placed in the center of the forehead, it symbolizes your rank in general. Um, then um, you could have even tattoos on the cheeks, and then that would symbolize work. So, you know, it was it would be. I read somewhere a, a comparison or analogy. Uh, it was like a barcode for the face, right? Your 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 face would be a canvas on which you would put uh, communication or messages for others, and then uh, the, the the purpose was basically for the group to be able to know who you are before they even start speaking to you. So the essential information about a person, a Maori person, would be inferred just by looking at them. And I find that very interesting because that means that we would put a certain public vision of us. Uh, out there immediately um, on our faces. So identity of persons kind of crystallized over time. So that was who you would think you were. So you could wear a ring or have a tattoo and then the group could accept you. But then others may also have an opinion of who you are. And in fact, you might have to prove yourself to others. So even 2,500 uh, years before the Common Era, the Egyptians would use censuses uh, to work out what's the scale of the labor that they had available, uh, for example, to build the pyramids or to re redistribute the land after the Nile uh, would flood annually, right? So, so they would create a pretty coarse census in the sense that they would just capture uh, the, the houses or the households and possibly uh, how many people live in each household. But they were very diligent in docu documenting that. And around the same time in China, they also used to run huge censuses uh, one of those captured 57 million people recorded in 12 million houses. So all of that was that important that they would go to extreme lengths, you know, codifying all of that on paper and then summarizing that information, reducing it, uh, that they could um, capture 57 million subjects before even uh, having anything to do with the digital systems that we have available today. So that was a huge effort because identity and the number of people or subjects available in a, a kingdom or empire was very, very important. The Romans also conducted regular censuses, for example, every five years, and then they, you would have to go to your house or basically the place where you came from in order to register. And if you didn't, that would lead to, um, to a lot of problems. Um, then what is the... You know, how was identity proven or how were the documents that would prove our identity created? Um, basically, Roman citizens would have sort of birth certificates and sometimes they were in free form or standalone form. So that was, I think, around the beginning of the uh, common era. Um, the citizen would basically receive a, like a wooden plate or a diptych, which was which had a wax surface. And then it acted both as a birth certificate and a certificate of uh, citizenship, right? So the kid would get a uh, citizenship certificate after uh, they were born. Um, and it was a few inches tall and wide. So basically, you know, more or less like uh, what you see on your, uh, on your screen, unless you're watching this on a Beamer. Um, and that would prove that you were a Roman, uh, Roman citizen. Um, and then the names would be written down. And then on the right hand side, you would have the names of witnesses who could attest that you are the person who you say you are. So this was especially important if you would uh, wander, wander out of Rome. Uh, you know, in Rome, you wouldn't necessarily lug your ID card uh, that was, you know, several inches wide and, and tall, um, you know, every day that you walk around. But when you walked out of Rome, it suddenly became more important. And 
the person's citizenship was something that was very important. And that citizenship was also related to the web of relationships that the person had. In fact, most scholars say that the web of relationships that you had, the human relationships, was almost more important than the citizenship proof or you know, any physical proof uh, that you might have. So your identity was, in fact, your social network. And, and we'll come back to this a little bit later. Um, then with time, um, you know, uh, if, if we look at, um, how people would move around and how they would prove their identity. Um, they would typically get a letter from the king and the king would say, yes, I, I attest that that person is safe and they can pass and they can go to another country. And then when you wander out of uh, the place where you live, that letter should be sufficient and then it would carry probably some security elements and so on. So here on the, uh, on the slide, you see the Safe Conducts Act from 1414. Uh, from the UK. It was an act of the Parliament of England, and it basically made it high treason um, to, to break the promise of safe conduct by killing, robbing, or spoiling the victim. So it was a sort of bare visa. If you were a traveler, you could show this paper and made by the king, encoded in the law, um, and that would be safe enough for you to be able to uh, to, to move around the countries that were not necessarily, or kingdoms, those that were not, not necessarily um, your own. And, you know, this started, this, this act of kind of guaranteeing safe passage started many years before that. So it started uh, even, I think, before the common era, the Chinese had uh, a way of controlling movement uh, across imperial territories with a document. And then there was the individual's age and height and some kind of bodily features written down in the document to be able to, identify the person. So anyone who would want to move across borders would have to present that document at a control point. And then, you know, if you read historical texts, including the Bible, you would also see many references uh, that have to do with um, safe passage and letters from an authority that basically guarantee, uh, guarantee that on the basis of identity. And then this concept evolved a little bit more. So here you see a French letter of passage uh, 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 let's say one of the first mentions of the words passport. So this is from the 1800s. And then again, there's a certain proof or, or certain guarantee uh, that you would be able to move around, uh, let's say fairly safely. And this was starting to get a little bit more industrialized. So it was on paper, it was signed and so on. And there's another example of a Japanese passport. So this comes from the later 1800s. Same concept, right? It would say basically that the person would be able to move around and then there are stamps that are official and they are able to actually travel. And that is something that is guaranteed by an authority. So the passport has evolved a lot and now we're getting a little bit more, uh, you know, touching on the privacy part. Uh, this is a key document that allows the residents and the, 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 well, the, the nationals of most countries um, to travel freely. Um, the funny thing is, you know, the funny thing about the modern passport is that um, a few hundred years ago, for example, in the U.S., um, you know, both men and women were able to have a passport. But if the woman would get if the woman would get married to a man, then the man's passport was the one that was that was used for for travel. And it would say Mr. John Doe or Mr. Such and Such and wife. And so, you know, the person, the full person would be reduced just to a small mention of uh, of being a wife and on top of that uh, your identity was dependent on someone else so for you to be able to prove who you are or for you to be able to move somewhere you would be reliant on another person so you can see how that leads to many problems uh, what that meant for privacy what that meant for control as well right so coming back to the modern passport um, this is a typical page that you would see. The layout of this page is very highly codified to a fraction of a millimeter. There are standards um, uh, for that prepared by the um, International Civil Aviation Organization. So they're the ones managing what passports look like, what standards they have to fulfill. And you see that you have a little uh, machine readable strip at the bottom. We're going to look into it in a moment. There's also sometimes a chip in the passport, so there can be RFID. Uh, um, in your passport, it's also bound to a specific standards and there can be more than one chip in a passport that you would typically see today. So for the, the first passports that were biometric would have uh, one or two chips, which had a few dozen kilobytes of memory, but they would 
in the picture, they would contain a lot of other information and that we would look at uh, in a moment. So there could also be a fingerprint in it or an iris and so on. But the point of this is to show you that we've evolved over time and only very recently, um, you know, identity became something that became very personal, very, very codified, that is, you know, uniquely attributable to a specific person. And that was not necessarily the case in the past. So the message here is that individual identity, as it is written in official documents, is something that is relatively recent. So just for your um, entertainment, we can look into what this code is. And in fact, there are many libraries that are open source that can read it. So if you are interested in reading this code, you can, you can decode it according to standards that are freely available. So for example, the letter P on the left-hand side would say that um, this is a passport, and then UTO stands for Utopia. So this is this kind of fictional country that is used for um, security documents. Uh, and it's a code of the state that issued the document, and then there are personal identifiers. So if here we see that a person called Anna Maria Eriksson uh, would be the subject identified by this, um, by this passport. And then you have fillers, which are these uh, triangular brackets and more information that becomes a bit harder to decode, but it's all positional. So basically you have a specified number of characters for a document number, there's a check digit for that, then your nationality. Uh, so that again could con connect to your, uh, let's say utopian identity, uh, the date of birth, a check digit for that, your sex, then the date of expiry, again, a check digit for that. And then some custom data that the state issuing can put in there and they are able to read it. And then finally, there's a check digit for that and an overall check digit. So, you know, if you look at it, it seems very simple, but there's already a lot of information contained in this. Um, and if you if you scan it with any kind of uh, in any kind of reader, it's very easy to deconstruct it. Right. I think, uh, you know, this is at the level of uh, very simple programming to be able to decode that. So, for instance, in this um, custom data. Or, or the details, the US uh, just has a link to a government file about you and they don't have that much identifying information, neither in the chip nor on the passport um, itself, right? So the US kind of is going to check that and then they share that data sometimes with certain countries. And then this machine readable zone or MRZ as it is called, uh, can also have more lines. So sometimes you would see three lines, for example, and that's also perfectly fine with the standard. So again, I'm showing you this not to illustrate any specific privacy issue, even though there are many with something like that, uh, but it is to demonstrate the concentration of the data and the industrialization of processing of the data when it comes to identity. So in a way, our data is really becoming um, widely available in bulk and digital technology has made it so that it can be read very quickly. So for example, here you see uh, what would be included in the chip that would sit on the passport. So there are several data groups uh, and there's things like a color picture, which is just a 15 kilobyte JPEG uh, with a very low re resolution by today's standards. So it is 240 by 320. Um, and there's also a monochromatic laser picture, well, grayscale uh, that has a slightly high resolution. So 620 by 800. And that smaller picture, the color one is used for an ID check. So when a person, uh, a border guard checks your passport, they typically open it, then they put it on the scanner and the scanner is able to say, uh, you know, more or less who you are, both from the data that is uh, written on the passport, but also from the data encoded in the, in the chip. Um, and then they would compare, for example, this digital picture to the picture that they see in the passport and then to your presence in front of them. So as you can imagine, this creates the need, this, this, this you know, density of data, which includes, for example, encoded fingerprints or encoded iris prints. Uh, this all creates a very significant uh, need for security. So there's several layers of that. And of course it is somewhat sophisticated. So there's basic access control where you can read the chip in the passport um, only if you have an access code. And that access code is in fact what we have just seen. So this machine readable zone is what will be considered the access code to, or, or you know, you generate the key to access the chip from reading that. So only when you physically have access, you know, visual access to that uh, line, you can open the information that's available in the chip. And then the second critical layer of protection is that you can only communicate with the chip physically when the passport is open, at least on most passports, this is done this way. So 
until you open your passport, you are not able to physically connect to the, to the chip, right? And then there are many other layers of control, country keys, issuer keys, um, data that, that relates to specific countries. Um, and then the terminal keys, for example, of the terminal that reads your passport are changed often, sometimes even as often as every shift. And then there's several, let's say, typical security or, or cryptography technologies like uh, chip authentication or terminal authentication through PKI, which are, which are implemented there. But the message here is that there's a lot of information about you. It's put in a document that is official. It is protected as well as it can be. Nevertheless, this information is available somehow uh, to be shared and grabbed based on decisions that are taken only with your marginal input, right? So this is something interesting, I think, to, to retain. So in terms of passports or, let's say, international identity documents, we've moved from an idea of authorized passage, which was sort of a whitelist, to free passage, which was a kind of whitelist plus. It was still a list of those who are allowed, and then you can pass if you're on the list. And then we moved to an autonomy, which is more like a blacklist model. So today, for example, someone ends up on a no-fly list in the US, uh, their life becomes very difficult because it's a big country and it's difficult to get around. Um, and everybody else is by default allowed to move around, right? So it's a blacklist in the sense that this person would end up uh, would end up there. And we've also progressed uh, in terms of the sensitivity of the information that's put in there. So we moved from a written description to photographs to biometrics. Um, and I will I will tell you a few things about why that is important. So uh, you know, written physical descriptions, which were kind of present in many documents before photography was was more widespread, uh, was considered very degrading to the individuals being described. And so already in the 1900s, uh, we switched very quickly to photography, right? And and photos replaced the descriptors because um, regular people like us were basically opposed to a description that said, you know, we have a broad forehead and a large nose and small eyes, for instance, right? Not everybody would like that. And at that point, even group photos were accepted in identity documents. So again, we're talking of an identity of a person or the privacy of a specific person, but then a group was accepted as a kind of identification of that. And then when we move more to biometrics, which is something we will probably discuss a little bit more in a bit more detail later as well, uh, we have to think about what that means. Well, the machine is reading biometrics, right? It's not a person that's going to take a look at our uh, fingerprints and say, oh yeah, these fingerprints match the, um, the, the see these fingerprints on the picture are gonna match the fingers that I'm seeing right now. This is a machine that does this. And that means that the machine is involved in determining whether you can travel and who you actually are. And that's also something very interesting because machines have really inserted themselves into the whole equation over time. And tomorrow, we'll, and especially on Thursday, we will speak much more about what that means for decision taking. You know, can the machine deprive us of decision freedom or can the machine deprive us of agency? These are, I think, very big problems in AI today or in ethics that we still um, will need to address. And then another, you know, funny fact about passports is that they were not required for international travel until after World War I. So for a very long time, borders were relatively open or at least were managed in a different way um, than they are today. So again, we see a link to our freedom and privacy uh, just from the fact that, you know, these documents became something that we find quite accessible. But I assure you that if you go to countries that are still developing and, and you say, okay, everybody has a passport, right? The answer will be no, not everybody has a passport. In fact, many people don't even have an identity. And there are still uh, hundreds of millions of people in the world who do not have an identity that's recognized by governments. And that's a very big issue. So if we think of national identity, um, this is also so in the in the mid 1800s, the UK also introduced databases of uh, criminals. So that leads to questions about uh, whether the government can take your data, under which conditions it would be, and well, they decided if someone commits a crime, then we can write down their name somewhere, and probably what they did. But all of this is still being challenged very widely, uh, you know, in, in, in especially uh, in um, in Anglo-Saxon countries, so the UK or the US. Uh, you know, for example, in the US, the Supreme Court still has regularly questions about what emanates from uh, or kind of what is the consequence of this kind of approach. Um, 
Right. So in this case, you see um, you see a very old, uh, very old um, identity uh, identity document. Uh, so the, the the person would be uh, basically from the North Syrian coast. Um, the person would be thirty seven years old when the ID was issued, and then the birthday is not listed. But there is a listed uh, there is a birth year listed, which is eighteen fifty six in this case. So there are details that come from this ID from the uh, Ottoman Empire that are written in a lot of detail. And then on the, uh, um, um, on the other side, you would have a kind of legal instruction, right? What does this mean? What does this, um, what does this document uh, allow for? And the card would have to be shown when you're selling, leaving, or transferring property. When you're selected for a government postal service, you're dealing with police, you receive a visa, or, uh, or you get married. And then if you're not able to show this ID, uh, you can get a fine up to a month or, or you could end up in prison for up to a month. And then uh, those who are conscripts, military conscripts and would avoid it, then uh, they would get conscript conscripted automatically if you cannot prove who you are and that you are out of the conscription age. And, you know, identity as national documents has, uh, has really been something that is very unevenly distributed and, and uneven, unevenly implemented. Um, here, for example, you see um, printouts of uh, the Indian Adhar identity uh, from the Adhar program. So they have the world's largest digital ID system. It started in 2010 to many challenges and, and is not universally liked by, uh, by, by citizens of India. But still, as of uh, 2019, I think over 1.2 billion persons were registered. And as of this year, there were billions upon billions, I think 70 billion authentications uh, with Adhar. So there are many issues with this program that have been highlighted elsewhere. I think it doesn't make sense to dwell on the details, but I think we should recognize also the very, very ambitious scale of the undertaking to provide identity to a country which uh, historically has not been able to do that for uh, all the citizens. So there is there's at least uh, an upside in terms of the execution and the technological challenge that was uh, overcome with that. And I think with time, that will improve to also serve the citizens better. So we looked at all that, you know, to have a better grasp on what is the connection of identity to privacy and identity or, you know, a person's identity typically is a collection of different attributes and they can be grouped into three different forms. So one form is inherent attributes that are intrinsic to an entity and that are not defined by relationships to external entities. Uh, others are accumulated ident attributes, so those that are gathered and developed over time. So this could be your health record, for instance, or your preferences, behaviors, what you like to eat, what you don't, and so on. And then there are assigned attributes, so that's something that someone else would give us, and then they would say, that's your national ID number, that's the phone number that the phone company gives you, that's your email address that your institution gives you, and so on. And you immediately see that typically when we speak of privacy, we worry about protecting many of these attributes because they define who we are. And in reality, when we protect our privacy, uh, we are protecting to a large extent our identity. So now the question would be, you know, given all the technology that we have today, wouldn't it be reasonable or wouldn't it be possible to have an identity for every relationship that we have? So for instance, if I have a relationship with a company that provides my phone service, I would have one identity to show them that proves that it's me, but possibly does not reveal everything about me. Or if I have an identity with a random ticketing service that sold me a ticket to a music festival, maybe I can give them another identity that still proves that it's me at the end of the line, but doesn't reveal all the details about me, right? Or the details that can be used to correlate my activity on that platform with some other platform. So your counterparties would be able to verify that it's still you, but they wouldn't know which you exactly they're talking to and it can be hard for them to collude against you and there are technical solutions that are very interesting and we'll talk about them in the next lectures to see how to get around this problem so as we said control when we talk of privacy there's a control over identity and there's also the question of agency so agency is the manifestation of your capacity to act or to take decisions and the question is, how do we retain it? Did we always want this agency? Did we always need to be private or separate and so on? So let's dive back into uh, the past again to take a look at how that developed over the years. Well, if we look at um, 
you know, very, very old times, hundreds of thousands, well, maybe 100 or 200,000 years ago, um, tribes lived together. There was a certain preference for solitude, but it was not very strong. And these are already studies, you know, well from the 50s uh, of the last century that, uh, that demonstrate that. So the default was we live together, but um, we sometimes have a preference for, for solitude. And in harsh conditions, especially, tribes would really stick together. So, for example, Inuits would do that. And then the desire to be alone would be considered rude. So, you know, there was a certain emergence of the individual. You were with your tribe. Um, so now coming back to the definition of privacy, um, it comes from the word privatio in Latin, which in fact means privatio is a taking away, a sense of deprivation, right? So you're deprived of the group. That's the point of view that uh, led to the development of the world of the word privacy, right? That's where it comes from. And in Latin, in fact, there is no word for privacy. That word comes from privatio, which is the, the, the act of deprivation or a sense of deprivation, but the word privacy itself doesn't really uh, exist. So what else in history tells us that people were comfortable with being together? Well, this is a picture from an ancient city. Uh, this is a Roman construction, and this is a public restroom. So you can imagine what, what were, you know, what comfort it provided, but it was a completely normal thing that you know you would sit there with a, a, a large amount of other people, and maybe possibly you would even have a conversation. And this was still considered, you know, an, a civilizational upgrade, right, in terms of hygiene and many other things. Uh, that you would have such a place which is related to taking care of the of the physical um, of the physical needs uh, of persons, and then you would have you know a whole infrastructure around it. Uh, that would be essentially a pooling of resources for uh, for efficiency. You know, Romans also lived in crowded uh, houses with very thin walls. Uh, you know, Greeks, when they would build houses, they would think about maximizing sunlight, but minimizing view. And it's proven in several studies that uh, the Greeks would design their houses in such a way that you can see not that much, but you can definitely get the sunlight in the house, right? That was a design principle. So still, despite the fact that we lived in groups, there was still some uh, spark of privacy or wanting to be alone. Then we have another example, which is uh, paper, uh, paper walls in Asia. So here, for example, you removed one of the senses from the ability to uh, interact with what's going on on the other side. So you could probably hear what's going on on the other side you wouldn't be able to uh, to see. So Chinese folding screens were first put uh, kind of in a, in a movable format, but then later uh, these walls were introduced, would be introduced as a movable item and element of the house. So there was a giant room typically, and then you would have these foldable screens that would develop some sort of privacy. And in a permanent open plan, you could of course modify it, but then there was a need sometimes to separate yourself. So they block light and vision, but then they don't, um, block sound and they encourage of course some kind of soft and graceful exchange so that possibly you're also mitigating the the sound leakage and traditionally the sliding doors cannot be locked so they could be open at any time that also tells you a little bit about the mindset then um, we have another example so in the early middle ages monks uh, started performing seclusion so basically they would live in such in such beehive huts um, and i think uh, over time um, you know, Christianity to some extent enforced a certain fight with self, uh, at least in Europe, and it encouraged introspection of being alone and uh, became more popular. If you take the example of an old uh, countryside, uh, countryside hut, you would see that people would live with farm animals in the same space, and it was normal. You wouldn't have the money and the resources to uh, to build walls and dividers, you were lucky to actually have a house that has its own walls and you would live with your family um, under one roof. And then going even further in time, you know, again, coming back to uh, religious implications, which of course had a very strong impact on the development of Europe, uh, you have the practice of confession. So basically people would go to confess their sins to a priest and confession used to be public. Uh, so um, over time, this was something that became more private and monks became inspired by, uh, even, even, you know, uh, monks in Europe became inspired by Eastern traditions of solitude, but uh, even such things as confession, which you would think are very, very personal, used to be public, right? So the, that invention, that ear confession comes from the Irish monks that have, uh, that have learned it from, 
uh, from China. And then if you had any heavy sins, so especially if you would be renouncing Christ, then uh, you would confess that in front of the whole congregation. So that was um, very serious business. And then private confession would allow to uh, confess the remaining sins. So that was something that went on for a very long time. So in addition to these, um, to these uh, you know, interesting peculiarities that we've looked at, uh, there are other factors that some argue were critical in you know, changing the way that we think about privacy. And for example, one of these developments that is mentioned is the invention of the printing press. So in the past, books were written manually. And at some point when the printing press was invented, those books would then become uh, let's say, you know, printed more accessible and more dense, but still were pretty rare. So um, earlier on, when you wanted to read a book, you would have to sit and study it and preferably be in solitude. So then that separation was somehow justified. Uh, but overall, for, let's say, the more general public, uh, reading books would happen in a public forum. So you could agree that because the press generated more books and more opportunities for reading, and then over time, it also generated uh, more people who were able to read books. Uh, you could then say that that increased the need for privacy and solitude because to read a book, we really need to mentally focus on reading it. And probably it's not very well done in a, uh, in a noisy place. So quiet study still was a luxury, but it was something that was more and more popular, I think, over time. Um, so looking further, um, we've also had uh, examples of cases that I think we would consider rather extreme. So for example, uh, in, in hospitals at some point, it was quite usual for, um, for the patients to stay in the same bed. People would also sleep in the same bed in the house. Uh, so communal living was definitely commonplace. You would have big beds at home. Um, and then the Black Death um, pandemic changed hygiene uh, really strongly. So on the picture from the 15th century here on the screen, you can see an example of a hospital uh, where multiple people reside in the in the same bed. So, like we said, um, technology had a very strong impact on privacy and our expectations of privacy. And this is a part of the problem. So, um, in that context, I wanted to, you know, point out that we feel that because of technology and technological development. Uh, our agency is threatened and our identity too, right? So our capability to act in who we are is to some extent threatened by technology. And that was also, you know, those particular factors were changed over time as we, um, as we evolved as a society. So I wanted to show you three main examples of how technology had something to do with privacy, even though that was from really old times. So it wouldn't be electronic or digital technology that we think about. So one interesting uh, trend has to do with um, people generally not being okay with others reading their letters. And in the past, there was a practice that is now called letter locking. And uh, we would fold letters in very elaborate ways in order to demonstrate when they have been opened. And that was, of course, before envelopes were invented. Envelopes are a relatively recent invention. So there was a study from MIT on 250,000 letters that demonstrated how uh, these and these letters were locked in ways that would be tamper evident before envelopes even existed to ensure uh, the recipient that the letter was not read by someone else. So obviously that was a way to keep secrets and to provide information about uh, the integrity of the letter and, and, and the fact whether the secret has been out or not. And some letters even had more than one type of letter locking, so they would be folded very elaborately again. Um, and some letters would be, you know, sent out completely free. But it demonstrated that there was a desire to maintain that. Even further, uh, you know, when we look at recent history in the U.S., for example, the postcard is an invention in itself. So obviously, the text that is written on the postcard is public. So, well, not necessarily public, but it's definitely publicly readable. Uh, and we hope that, you know, the integrity of the postal workers allows us to send messages without uh, being read. But that's, of course, a hope. It is not a proof. And, you know, there were many laws um, from, from even the 1700s put in that have forbidden postal workers from reading mail. Um, and the thing about the postcard is that it was much cheaper than a letter. So you could trade off um, a little bit of your privacy. Basically, somebody could read what you wrote. Uh, for a certain savings that you would have 
uh, gained by not sending a full letter, but instead sending a postcard. So many communicated that way in the, um, in the early 20th century, for example, in the US. But it was already pointed out then that there is an expectation of communication privacy. And it's not accepted that somebody just takes that postcard and reads it. But the funny thing is that in, for example, um, American law, this idea of having something on the envelope or inside the envelope lives still until, um, until today. And I'll tell you about that in a moment. So another interesting invention was that of the camera, of the photographic camera. So suddenly with the advent of photography, you were able to immortalize something very quickly with relatively little effort. That's very interesting because in the past, when you wanted to have somebody's portrait, you would have to sit down, get a painter, the painter would then paint that portrait. Uh, and you know, they would have, they would need some skill, you need to pay for it. So obviously it was not something easily accessible and you wouldn't necessarily, you know, paint a landscape or, uh, you know, a random house that, that you feel like you would like to immortalize that was something not accessible. Um, so very quickly, people realized that this is an issue because something that used to take a very long time and, you know, we kind of consciously went into it became uh, achievable on a very short time scale. So in a very short time, you could do something that used to last a very long time. And it means that the barriers to access to whatever was being immortalized um, was an issue so because that, that barrier to access was, was much lower. So privacy and things around that change. And so um, this actually led and, you know, the, the emergence of newspapers and gossip columns led uh, to one of the most famous and most fundamental texts in privacy, at least in the Western world, which is the right to privacy by Samuel Warren and a colleague of his, of his um, printed in the Harvard Law Review in 1890. So there Samuel Warren writes that later they came a recognition of man's spiritual nature, of his feelings and his intellect. Gradually, the scope of these legal rights broadened. And now the right to live, the, the right to life, has come to mean the right to enjoy life, the right to be let alone. And that was something that was quite revolutionary. Of course, the text is multiple pages long. It has, I think, 20 or 30 pages. So it goes into much more detail than this quote. But it shows that recent inventions and business methods and, for example, the advent of instantaneous photography, uh, the widespread circulation of newspapers have contributed to invasions of an individual's privacy. And Samuel Warren has seen that. And, and wrote about that in Harvard Law Review. So that's very interesting. And I think that's one of the cornerstones of the way that uh, kind of privacy is being treated, at least in Western um, cultures. Um, and then another example I wanted to show you is that of party lines. So um, party lines were multi-party or multi-terminal telephone lines. So it was very expensive and complicated to run a wire to a place. So at that point, what would happen is uh, they would run a wire to a building and then inside that building all the telephone lines would be shared uh, on that main trunk line um, and then different apartments would for example have a specific sequence of rings and then they would recognize that somebody is ringing them and not uh, somebody else so this was between this could have been between two and 20 parties that would be involved in this each family had their own code and then you know of course phones would ring when somebody um, else was ringing as well, right? So, for example, if your neighbor gets a call, then you obviously hear it, and you just know it's not for you uh, by the sequence of the ring. So, this was this was something popular and you know a relatively affordable service between the 1900s and the 1930s. Um, but there actually were many posters and kind of let's say propaganda leaflets that were advising um, the participants in such party lines to maintain a certain level of courtesy and culture and basically not get in each other's way, put the receiver on the hook when they're done talking and so on. So again, technology had a lot to do uh, with privacy and the convenience or the usefulness of having a phone line uh, was good enough for us to then sacrifice the privacy and somebody might be listening, of course, to what we're discussing with, uh, with our caller. So the privacy and the law is a subject that could in itself be, be a university course. I just want to give you a few uh, key points maybe that are interesting. So in the 1600s in the UK, there was this uh, doctrine created which says that my house is my castle. So basically, um, you know, it was written that not even the king could go into somebody's house without permission. So there was a very strong accent on kind of private property and the sphere of, uh, of privacy that would be in one's home. Um, then later on in the 1700s, there was a lot of 
uh, legislation around the freedom from unreasonable searches. For example, the Fourth Amendment in the US Constitution appeared. And at the time, searches invaded physical space, uh, but modern invasions don't require invading physical space. So for example, what would happen uh, if a policeman would like to search your cell phone, uh, which contains lots of data about you, who you communicate with, and so on. And then the U.S. Uh, Supreme Court ruled at some point that in certain cases, it is not justified for policemen to search your cell phone without a warrant, but they could search your physical belongings or the car if they have a suspicion that the crime um, would be committed. So essentially, um, you know, this would uh, this would really the way that the law was made a long time ago still lives on today and very often the the court or supreme courts have to take decisions that are really based on um whether you know someone a very long time ago has made the law well and has foreseen things that they couldn't even imagine or uh, not really so in the us for example it has been decided that they cannot search your phone without a warrant they cannot track you 24 7 with the gps without a warrant but they can take your dna because the argument is that the DNA taken to identify you is garbage DNA anyway, and it's not going to identify any diseases that you might have or anything really specific about you, but it would still identify you uniquely. But now, as we understand DNA better, there is some opposition to that, right? So we do not, according to the courts uh, in the US, we would not have an expectation of privacy uh, related to uh, our DNA like we would have, for example, for uh, fingerprints and so on. And then, you know, again, this idea of having something on the envelope or inside the envelope is a distinction that's very important because it implicates how rulings are made about email privacy, for example, which means that the metadata that is related to email uh, can then be uh, possibly read by third parties or captured by law enforcement. However, the contents of the email might not be able to, uh, to, be, um, to be captured in the same, uh, in the same way. And then, you know, several other um, acts that were quite important appeared. So the Declaration of Human Rights provides a right to privacy. Uh, the Data Protection Directive from the EU was a founding point that kind of led to GDPR, which is much stronger today. And then the General Data Protection Regulation of the EU really changed the way that data is treated across the world. And I know that many of you would be bothered by uh, the annoying cookie pop-ups, but in general, that legislation and, and, and that law has done uh, a lot of good for privacy and understanding privacy and the conversation on privacy that would be uh, across the world. Um, so to kind of finish this off, I wanted to um, come back to another very interesting philosophical thought, which is that of the panopticon. So the law cuts both ways. The law can protect us, but the law can also observe us. Um, and this is an example that's really liked and well, uh, let's say, uh, spread amongst the privacy advocates for a very good reason. Uh, because in the panopticon, there is an inspection principle applied. And that principle says that basically you would be able to construct a building which is round and has cells that have an opening towards the center. And only one guard that would remain in the center is sufficient to surveil um, everyone that is in the prison. So it is applied uh, universally to everybody who's in the prison because the, the prisoners or the captives are unaware of when they are being watched. So just because they might be watched makes them feel like they actually are watched. So it's extremely powerful because you apply surveillance only at certain times. So you make the effort of surveilling only at certain times, but you get the effect almost all the time. And this is why mass surveillance is such a high risk to society, right? Because it could be corporations monitoring you, it could be governments monitoring you, it could be secret services, it could be the military during war or invasions. So that principle really leads to a lot of, uh, let's say to a philosophical domino that then tells us how that can develop in the future and why is that important for, uh, for our privacy. So um, here I have a quote from Glenn Greenwald who was one of the instrumental figures in, um, in publishing uh, many prominent leaks. And he says that people make decisions that are not a byproduct of their own agency, but that are about the expectations that others have of them. And I think it's a very powerful quote because it says that when we are being watched, our behavior significantly changes. So we trend towards conformist or compliant behavior. We apply self-censorship and so on. And we'll talk more about that on Thursday, on the third day, uh, about this and a phenomenon that's related to this 
that is called social cooling. And then to, you know, to finish off with an even, even let's say, deeper thought, um, we, have, uh, we have a quote here from Michel Foucault, who, uh, who's one of, uh, you know, the top thinkers of the 20th century. And he says, he writes that, uh, hence the major effect of the panopticon to induce in the inmate a state of conscious and permanent visibility that assures the automatic functioning of power. So to arrange things that the surveillance is permanent in its effects, even if it is discontinuous in its action. So what this means in practice is that you create a prison in your own mind. So you lead towards self-censorship, towards conformity, submission, and that in turn can promote tyranny. And I think nobody is okay with that, with, uh, with having their freedom crippled. So a freedom very often is in fact not measured by um, how a system treats the compliant, but uh, how it treats those who oppose it, right? That's the, that's the useful measure of freedom, I would say, that could be applicable also in our modern times. So, you know, we can mix that with what we just said before, that privacy was a luxury and it kind of still is. So the question would be whether we have really gone past the golden age of privacy with the advent of digital technology, are we able to continue, um, you know, the quest for privacy or, or is it something that's lost? And I want to leave you with this one main thought, which is that our privacy is important because it allows us to remain in control and to maintain our identity. And if there's one takeaway message that I would like to leave you with, it's definitely this one. And if you're, uh, you know, if you have any thoughts about this or you would like to converse further, please don't hesitate to drop me a line at the address that's in the corner. So thank you very much for listening. And I look forward to speaking to you tomorrow again.